Hello, and welcome to the Wellness Musketeers podcast, where we discuss health, wellness, fitness, and more broadly, the art of living. I'm, I'm your host, Aussie Mike James, a freelance writer and speaker with over 30 years of international experience managing leading corporate fitness in Australia and in Washington, D.C. with the World Bank Group. I'm joined by my fellow musketeers, Dr. Richard Kennedy, an internist who has over 36 years of clinical experience, including the World Bank Clinical Services and Private Practice, Kettle Hiding, an economist with 30 years of experience, 35 years of experience, most recently 24 years with the IMF, and Kettle has a keen interest in health, wellness, and the intersection between wellness, society, and how organizations function. And last but certainly not least, the handsome David Liss, a DC-based journalist and media professional. So today, welcome, Wellness Musketeers, to a special episode where we're going to look at the current state of COVID. Now, as we enter the fourth year of the pandemic, the virus continues to challenge us with new variants and health impacts. And today we'll explore the latest development, navigate common concerns, and try and equip our listeners with the knowledge to safeguard their, all of our wellness profiles and our wellness futures. So I'd, I'd just like to get the ball rolling a little bit, guys, and full disclosure on our panel, could we give us a little bit of a history? Have you actually had COVID at this point of the journey? Dr. K, what about you? Yes, twice. Twice. Yeah, okay. I yeah, I had it in 20, which was probably the worst of it. And I knew I was going to get it because six or seven people in the building and on our floor in the clinic got it. So it was the matter. And, and I knew who the index case were. So there was a patient who came in and said, I'm not feeling well. I have a fever. I'm coughing and um, we took her temperature and then I asked her, why don't you put a mask on it? She said, oh, you no, know, I've, I've had a common cold like this before. I just want to make sure it's not flu. And back then we could test them in the office for COVID. Of course, she had it. So then everybody else got tested the next two days and I was fine. On the fourth day, I got COVID. And back then, when you got COVID, you had to be away from everybody for 14 days. And fast forward to 20, essentially three and a half weeks ago, out of the blue, without warning, I developed a cough. And I said the only connection was I had flown to Mississippi to be, meet with my daughter. And I flew back, and it's a short flight, and like an hour flight from Jackson. Mississippi to Houston and I had my mask with me, but I didn't. And because it's such a short flight and it's a small plane, even that short period of time, nobody was wearing a mask in the plane except one person, the person sitting in front of me. And three days later, I developed a cough. And that's, I'm assuming where I got COVID from. And at the time, I just, all I had was a cough. I took Paxlovid. And in two days, I was fine, had no other symptoms. I just wore a mask around the house with everybody, and it was fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I compare the two, the second time was a very mild case. The first time I had four or five symptoms, cough, runny nose, sneeze, or headache, chills, diarrhea. I didn't have, all I had was a cough. That was a drop off for three days, actually, and then it was good. Huh. So what about you, Kittle? I've had it months, as far as I know, and several in the family had it. We, we were traveling to Argentina. I think this was like maybe a year after the COVID had started getting around. So I was vaccinated probably twice, and my symptoms were quite mild. Uh, did because of my age take medication but after a week it was pretty much gone and that's the only time i know i've had it well, what about you dave for me in covid yeah. about two years ago i had i know who i got it from I, I worked out with this guy wednesday morning and he said well my wife has covid and by friday I had COVID. and i had it 
relatively bad. I had a horrendous cough for several months and I thought I might have long-term COVID and it was, I had to go to a, uh, a pulmonologist mm -hmm. because the cough just was really bad and wouldn't stop. It was very strange. I had, I, you know, fully vaccinated, uh, grateful for that. And I always wonder to what degree myself and many other people I've met, we may have had some episode of COVID and not had it registered yeah. that it's a full blown, it, it is, it was COVID. All right. Well, uh, it's interesting all of it because I haven't had it at all. And this is my question to you, Dr. K, without going to a long explanation. I just think right now since I retired and I'm not looking after 3,000 members of the World Bank Fitness Center anymore. And knowing all of your histories, I think I have less people contact than most of you, than all three of you. And I'm not a recluse by any means. I'm just thinking in my non-medical logic here, and I'd like to get your opinion, Dr. K, would that be the reason or a major reason for me not getting it? I just haven't had the people contact that you three have had. I'm fully vaccinated. Well, so that, that's a good point. And there's truth in that. If you're not in a place where you're being exposed, then there's less likely a chance that you'll get it. Now, we also know like any other viral infection, such as the flu or the new one that's out and everybody's talking about RS. We're all getting exposed because they are all airborne organisms. They're in the air. So that means is you don't necessarily have to be standing next to the person who has the symptoms. Someone could cough on one side of a store and by the time you get there, you inhale those particulate matters and then it might, and then typically will take two to three days before the person will get sent. Now, depending on the response of your immune system, if your immune system recognizes, oh, that's a foreign subject and it recruits all of the immune cells to come out there, you may not get COVID. Well, hmm. so I would almost say that because you have traveled, you have been with others, I think when you were celebrating your birthday and everything, out and about with folks, I guarantee you were around somebody who had it. They may not have had any symptoms because we know that it can take up to two to five days after exposure for a person to develop symptoms. So that's why, you know, like with me saying that he worked out with somebody whose spouse had COVID. Right. By default, that the spouse had COVID, it's almost mm. possible for that person to not have been exposed. So by default, you spending any time with that individual means you were going to get exposed to. And again, what we have seen since COVID has come, because it's the, the virus that has changed its stripes pretty frequently in short mm. periods of time, i.e. the different variants. Because since COVID has come out, there have been 26 variants. Hmm. Wow. Well, there are 26 variants, but what has happened since the Omicron, Omicron was worse than 2020, but as it has changed, the amount of the, the virility of it, the aggressiveness of it has been less. And we see that now that, and again, Although like the flu is typically a winter illness, all the other viruses, COVID has been a year round for the most part. It peaked in the winter. Why? Because we're all indoors more often. We're all in enclosed spaces with other people. And so we've changed our habit. COVID forced us all to look at hygiene, personal hygiene, more the world has ever done. The Asian community has always looked at it that way, but the rest of the world didn't. So when we started having people use hand sanitizers, everywhere you looked, there was a hand sanitizer. Now people carry hand sanitizers in their cars or in their purse with them. You still have people who carry masks with them. And not <laughs> during the winter season this year, the number of COVID cases went up in the United States. 
the number of hospitalizations for COVID went up in the United States, but nothing like it was in 2020 to 2022. Nothing like it. Now, there are facts and reasons for that. People got vaccinated. Yeah. The more people got boosters. Um, people changed their behavior. People would, if they knew they were going to be in an enclosed space, didn't feel uncomfortable to put a mask on. And so people went out and you see people today here in Texas, like for instance, they go to the local Walmart here or the local Kroger's, the supermarket here. Half the staff that worked in there is wearing a mask all day long. A great example. For some reason, Valentine's Day is a huge event in Texas. I never saw anything like it. I never saw so many flowers and gifts and things like that. They, they literally set up an entire place where floral arrangements are out in the parking lot. In particular, pick up flowers and candy. But when that was happening, you saw people who were working wearing masks. I know people now that the, the Valentine's Day is over and we're back to sort of a regular routine, the same people in the supermarket who were wearing masks aren't. Right. So it's a very selective sort of thing. And I think it has to do with what your personal experience has been with COVID. So mm. like you mentioned earlier, some people don't ever bother to get tested. They just based on what they know from friends, family, what they've read or heard. Hey, I got COVID. I'm going to just stay home. I'm going to do it. And they go, lucky that's all it is. Even the amount of long COVID, because typically we say, a person has long COVID if they have one or more symptoms for more than a month. So by definition, Dave, you had long COVID. That what we didn't know is how long that might last. Everybody's a little bit different. Yeah, well, there's this guy I met. I was hacking up almost a complete long every day. And he was a financial consultant. And I was just hacking. And then he was telling me that he had long COVID. He got in all these different groups to try and understand how to work with the symptoms. He had been unable to exercise for a long period of time. He gained weight. He'd had fatigue. He had all these other symptoms. And then for him, over time, fortunately, they started to fade and myself with the cough. But I took a Uber and the guy who was my Uber driver, I was coughing at that time too, and with a mask on in the back. and. He said he almost died. He had a uh, liver failure what? from COVID. Yeah. And I had no idea that it could affect a person in that way. It affects every system in the body. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, which ones are pri pri primarily predominate at that time. There are different reasons why. And this has to do with your overall general health. And it's sort of why you see the majority of people who have succumbed to COVID have been people who had concomitant health issues that may, that attack their own immune system. So mm -hmm. things like diabetes, things like asthma, those things are because they're constantly in a chronic, <laughs> your immune system is constantly fighting. And then it feels really good at fighting one thing at a time. But I mean, I, I have a question. So, Dave, are you free for long COVID, you think? And uh, then the question to Dr. Kennedy is, what's the percentage of people who get long COVID or those who are infected? So I'd say the percentage of people who get long COVID, hard to say, but I'd probably say it's between 10 and 15%, which is a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a lot because we, 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 and what do we know about the courses on how to actually treat it, because I think there are some kind of research and then different hypotheses out there. Yeah. There's a lot of research that has been going on and they've been studying the uh, long COVID cases to the point where pretty much all of the large uh, medical centers around the world, as well as in this country, have set up what we call them long COVID clinics. Mm. And what they really are, all of the specialties 
be it cardiology, be it gastroenterology, neurology, pulmonology, infectious diseases, psycho- psychiatry, mental health, all of them get together and try and they take each individual case, look at what the symptoms are. The first thing they do is, okay, forget that it's COVID for a moment. What would I treat this with just based on this person's symptoms and that we know it's a viral infection? So then they start that particular process. And what they found is that there are some people who, who recover really quickly, and then there are other people who a year in, a year and a half out, still have remnants of the symptoms. So these people get put in physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, all of that. They go through all of these things. And at least the last time I looked at the research, a lot of the research doesn't really understand why some people get long COVID and others don't. Because you also have people who have diabetes or has been treated for cancer, things like that, heart failure, and they don't get COVID. Mm -hmm. Or if they get it, they get mild symptoms and they're done. The only caveat that people think is that since more and more people in the world have gotten vaccinated and boosted, and because even though the variants have changed, the effect of the boosters, even though they change them, they're still effective in countering. And all they're really trying to do is to neutralize what the virus can do in the human host. That's all of them. Dr. Kennedy, as a doctor, have you had... People come in as patients that didn't believe it was real or didn't believe in getting vaccines or things sure. like that. Sure. How do you deal with that? Or how do, what do you say? Well, you, you, you tell them. So most of the people who don't believe it, not that they don't believe it's real. They believe it's an infection for sure. It's kind of hard when the entire world is being affected by it for you to not believe that it exists. But what they'll say is there are a lot of people who've just been anti-vaxxers. They think that being vaccinated has caused problems. Since vaccination is essentially a medication. And like any medication that has ever been given to humans, even if it's over the counter, it has the potential to cause harm to somebody. Yeah. You did, the problem is you can't really predict who it's going to, you kind of know based on studies. So with all those people they had in the trial before they initially re-released the Pfizer, the Moderna vaccines was that they found that, okay, yeah, there were a few people, but the percentage was less than 1% who had bad reactions to the vaccine. Well, those people, you tell them and I've had people who've had family members who've gotten COVID. Remember, I had a gentleman who had gone to visit his daughter in another state and basically got COVID when he got back, was hospitalized on a respirator. And then when he was finally cleared and returned, he had to get clearance to go back to work. So he came in to see me. We start talking about getting vaccinated. Well, there was no reason to vaccinate him immediately because his body had already, but with all of the infection that he had, the immune system had already produced. But the recommendation was is that in six months, three months, you should get vaccinated. His argument was, why should I get vaccinated now? I've already had it. And I said, well, the problem is you get this again. And you've already had a near scary experience being on a respirator. Wow. We don't want this to happen again. And he said, I'll take my chance. I just don't understand that. It's not, well, just to, like, uh, what's that line? Denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Thank you. That's just, and it help that you have people out there spewing that it's not real. It's poison, they're trying mm. to put chips inside of you and all this other kind of nonsense. So when you have that happening, and again, people are, people just sometimes are looking for a reason not to do something. 
And if you give them money, yeah, you have to make weed, and they're good. In the beginning, it was uh, long, uh, it was rolled out as an emergency measure, but that changed. So I, I could have some sympathy with people who were somewhat afraid because it was an emergency measure. But uh, since then, there's been a lot of more observations. And oh yeah. So if you're anti, but if you're anti-vaxxer, of course, it's an easy thing. But then you know, I think. Unfortunately, some people have become anti-vaxxers yeah. after this. Very true. Very. Is COVID a crisis now? Because I feel like people are just put it away and they're done with it for the most part. Like, if I go to a gym, you don't really need to wipe up after yourself. Or if you go what to you a, Well, I mean, it seems like people are kind of half, but, but in many places you go, it's like it doesn't exist. It's yeah. like it's gone. Well, but again, not so. First of all, it's not gone. And once any viral infection sort of decides to express itself to the world, it never really leaves. It will have quiet moments. And but problem is, we only react to it when it becomes crisis. It's not as much a crisis as it was in 2020 and 2021, for sure. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that a large percentage of the world has been vaccinated. A large percentage of the world has changed their hygiene behavior, you know, that, and so therefore you've gotten away from it being a crisis, but it's something that is still here why they continue to recommend the vaccine, partly because the virus continues to change its stripes. But if someone says that, oh, it's just like the flu. I mean, in flu, you need a vaccine. Yeah. What would you, be your response? And well, the only time the flu killed as many people and as this did, was in 19, and sure. that was before we had any vaccine. Since we've had a vaccine against the flu, and they've been doing a good enough job of being able to predict the newer strains that come with flu each year, it's not nearly been the same. The other thing is, flu has never been, for the most part, a year round infection. COVID uh -huh. is a year round infection. You can get it anytime, anywhere, and any part of the year. It doesn't have to be wind. Flu is mostly a winter, early spring infection. But do we have a total of data uh, for the situation now and comparing flu and deaths to COVID? Well, you mean in terms, well, the. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how to compare it, but I would think that it's the probability. If you're no, well, the, I the, don't know. I mean, it, well, it basically, I would, the, I would say the the death toll from flu each year, for the most part, has been consistent over the year. It hasn't mm -hmm. changed very much. We're nowhere where we were, where a million people were dying, sure. and like it was at its height. Yeah, it's just that. When this is the most, and the best way for me, I look at it, it is still the most contagious thing the world's ever seen. Hmm. Yeah. And so, yes, the flu is contagious, but not everybody who gets exposed to the flu will get it. Well, same thing with COVID. The problem is that whereas flu has predominantly been an upper respiratory a deep respiratory problem. COVID, basically, because of what it does, it attacks the body. It increases clotting mechanisms, which mm -hmm. normally is not a good thing in other parts of the body, in certain parts of the body. Mm -hmm. So, it, and that's why when you mentioned earlier, someone could have had liver failure. Mm -hmm. They had someone who started passing blood through their stool. You could have had someone coughing up blood. You could have had someone who had a stroke, someone having a heart attack, someone's kidney failing, the pancreas being down. All of this can occur with COVID. 
You don't see that with the flu. Oh. You just don't see that with the flu. And then long COVID as well, which we don't yeah. know that much about. You don't see, you know, most people who get the flu, they'll be sick for a period of time, but they're going to recover. They're going to recover and they're done. Is COVID unusual in that there's a long COVID? There's no long flu necessarily, is there? First, I've heard of it, that there's been uh -huh. a thing that has legs that continue. And when you look at it, those people who have long COVID, if you test them, there may not be any evidence that the COVID is positive unless you do really specific tests. That, like when I was going through the worst of it, like they didn't want to test me. Yeah, and they expected you to be positive. And we knew that, you know, in the very beginning, we had people who would test positive for COVID, have no symptoms at all, and stay positive for six months. Oh. You know, so we had people who were completely asymptomatic and they only tested because a significant other who they live yeah. with tested positive and had symptoms, so they tested. But we know that the, the body's ability to sort of wash it all out so that you get a negative test can be three to six months. Uh, let, let me ask you guys, I mean, you've all had it, and Dave, you sound like you've had it very badly. What's the major difference you've found with COVID and flu, just in terms of the visceral symptoms? What, what made it different? Well, for me personally, it was this really severe cough. I mean, I was in finally getting six pack abs in my life, but it was from coughing. I mean, that was the only thing that upset me about getting better from the cough is that I thought my six pack's going to go away. I had never experienced a cough like that. I never experienced an illness that lingered for an indeterminate, unpredictable period of time. You know, I wasn't sure how to approach work in the sense of going into the office or just because the cough was so bad. I finally did go back, but I found a way to isolate myself. And it was, it was kind of crazy too, because at the, the same organizations that were like not letting people come in, now it was an employment issue because you wanted to go out because I didn't know how to work with the cough that I had. What about you, Dr. K? What was the difference you feel between that and flu? The two times I've had the flu in my life, I would acutely ill for a week right. and I had all the typical, I had a cough, I had a runny nose, I had a headache, I was nauseated, I had a fever, I had body aches and chills, um, my whole body hurt, I, I, I couldn't do anything for a week and then, but then it, when it stopped, it stopped in a week, a day or two after, but I got back to normal. Whereas if I had the, the first time I had COVID, after I had no longer had the cough, no longer had the, 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 the aches and the pains and things like that, I was just tired for a month. I didn't have the level of energy that I normally had. And just doing normal things wore me out. And also COVID was the first time I, as a clinician, I'd seen people get a cold, and I'm sure there are other conditions that do it, but get a, a symptom, and their only symptom is that I can't feel anything anymore, and I can't taste. Okay. I've seen that before, you know, unless you had specific sort of thing, and it would linger for the longest period of time. So it was odd to see that, and again, once again, something I've not seen, and that's the thing about COVID is that because it affects the entire body. Any symptom, and it's why when you go and look up symptoms of COVID, they give you the sort of common sort of things, but you could lift a hundred and all be accurate. Right. Because somebody could get it. Yeah. What about you, Kettle? What's the difference you found between uh, COVID and the common flu or cold? I mean, I didn't get very sick, you know, when I had the flu, the fever was much higher. And also I had experienced that it was acute and then it goes away here. It's, I mean, it was more, uh, not that clear what was really going on, but I, I did feel something and they kind of took 
probably longer to go away. I mean, it, it's also, I, I don't know, maybe I have some effects of something. I mean, it's, there's this doubt. Mm-hmm. Because you also read about things that it affects your body in a different way. Okay. That's why I'm mostly concerned about the long COVID. I know people who lost their smell and the, after, I think, a year, still not there. Well, Richard, I wonder if you could comment on this case that got a bit of popular media attention. When we talk about being totally reclusive, uh, as some people were and haven't gotten over that, it's still like that. There was the case of uh, Howard Stern. They say he's almost a total recluse, lives in his huge apartment in New York City. Very rarely get that, but he got COVID. Now, the common theory for us non-medical people is to say, well, he didn't build up any natural immunities because he's staying inside the whole time. Could you comment on that? Is that any truth in that? Oh, yeah, that's true. You don't yeah. expose your, your immune system won't feel a threat, so it won't try to develop things that it doesn't need to. Now, that being said, remember, this is an airborne organism, so it's in the air. So he may not go out of his apartment, but there are people who may walk on the floor that he lives on. Yeah. There may be people who deliver his meal. There may be people who take, pick up his laundry and take his laundry. Often those things, people are breathing. And so the air circulates there. So it more his, wife is, his wife leads a normal life, so I was guessing. Yeah. Be for so everybody, so the issue is we're all going to get exposed. Mm-hmm. The issue is, is will you have symptoms? If you're unlucky, you'll have symptoms. If you're really unlucky, you'll end up in the hospital. And normally, I think, I think it was Baba Booey's fault myself. I'd blame Baba Booey if I were Howard. Like he always does. No. And I have friends who, when you know how, as we loosen the things up and we're getting yes. some degree of normal, where we can go out and we can get together again in, in public places, I have friends who wouldn't do so for instance i have four friends that i've known since 1970 and we quarterly used to get together to have dinner things like that or all that kind of stuff well one of them he wouldn't go out he wouldn't. and and if he went anywhere he'd wear a mask even if he was around other people he sit in a, he sit as far away from everybody as he could. He would text us his joke. You know, we'd be sitting on the other side of the restaurant. <laughs> joke. Well, for some people, they're afraid, and and there are some people that okay, I'm afraid. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to. I don't want to have to deal with. And we've all been touched by somebody we know who's gotten COVID and gotten it bad enough that we saw them suffering. Even if we weren't with them, we heard about it. We would call them, we'd see them on Zoom, we'd see them on a video. And, you know, when you see those things, those things take heart to you yeah. feel that. And so human nature is protect thyself. You know, how do I protect myself? So for some people, they'll do the extremes and go, okay, I'm, you know, me and the planet, okay, I, I'll come out if absolutely have to. But I'll, you know, I'm going to wear a glove, I'm going to have a mask on, I'm wearing a hat, you know, my sleeves, my, I never wear short sleeves, none of all the little things for fear of that happening. I, when I first got COVID, the first time I got COVID, because I'm living with other people, I lived in the basement. And I got all my food, you know, they would knock on the door and say, your, your meal's ready. Wait till I leave. They close the door and I go up the steps to get my meal. So and I was put in the basement as well. You know, that's why I say I never want to hear the word mental again. Lost luster really quickly. One of my uh, good colleagues, the World Bank, who is a psychologist, said that it's also had the effect beyond the physical and contributed to the, the loneliness epidemic out there because. People who had a predisposition who would probably go home and live their own life were lead to the lonely instance. It's, it's exacerbated that because it's given them now more of a fear of even uh, 
going out. Have you, have you guys experienced that? You'd seen people would become more yeah. reclusive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a real problem in society because you think you'll just never hear from these folks. And, uh, I haven't experienced it that much myself, but there's, maybe that's also because the people I'm surrounded by. But I've been particularly concerned about what we've seen with children and, and lost years of schooling. Yeah. And I think yeah. One thing with COVID is different from some of the other illnesses we talk about is how it affects people on the age spectrum. So cool. younger are less likely and the, so it, maybe there was some overreaction when it came to children and the youth because also the, the psychological impact has been large. There, there was a, a man I was talking with and he was a counselor in a high school and he was talking about how you had these kids that were all of a sudden they're in high school and when they left, they were in elementary school or something like that because... Two years at home and all this time behind the screen and then having to readjust and not being able to just shut something off when you're trying to be yeah. in front of it and totally. just socialization. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that the children, particularly the children under the age of 10, they might suffer a little bit more because those are formative years where you're learning socialization, how to interact with people, how to engage yourself in, in the school world, in the family world, learning the, the sort of right from wrong kind of thing, whereas now you give them a, a laptop and you give them a computer or an iPad and you say, basically, look, this is how we're going to communicate with you. And there are some of us who, as we grow up, we're more comfortable being by ourselves. Yes. And then there are people who are more comfortable. They need to be in the crowd. They need to be in the mix. You lost that. So you literally put an entire generation of kids in this environment where get used to your communication is a screen. Yeah. I mean, it, I have friends and their kids have no close friends in the physical world. Their friends are all virtual from the game they play. They could be in. Kenya, Canada, or Kentucky, mm -hmm. and but they don't have anyone they could go ride a bike and get a sandwich with. Yeah, for sure. Which turn back to the vaccines a little. The often quoted misgivings of the people who don't like vaccines is they say that there's a high incidence of myocarditis. Could you comment on that from the vaccine? Well, what is myocarditis? It's inflammation of the heart muscle, and so. First and foremost, I always say it depends on who's making the statement. Right. So by definition, any side effect of anything is high if you happen to be the individual or individuals who get it. But if, you know, and I always say, think of it from the perspective, they gave out 70 to 100 million people got vaccinated in the U.S. And maybe less than 1%. Those people got myocarditis. So you hate to sort of label it as the number kind of thing. But the way we look at drugs and their safety profile, that it can't be something that gives such significant side effects that we, and, and I don't know the actual numbers that they're talking about, but it's such a unique thing that they'll pull it off the market if it's causing that many side effects, particularly if the side effect is leading to death, they'll pull it off the market in a heartbeat. But there are people who will take aspirin or Tylenol and have bleeding from taking that than the people who are taking this vaccine. And you're sorry for the people who do get the side effect. But that's the thing is you can't make one chemical that is going to be suitable for the entire global population. So there's just enough differences in all of us that right. what one person might react to, others may not. When we're talking about the children and infants, uh, Rich, and again, it's purely anecdotal, but I think a lot of people might have experienced this. I had my little buddy, Sammy, who you've both met, who was only under two years of age, and he fell asleep on my shoulder for about an hour one day. Mm -hmm. Next day, he got diagnosed. He had infant COVID. I got absolutely nothing. Well, because I was vaccinated or because his little system just couldn't count, you know, enter into my, I, I had no idea. 
Coming. Probably had something to do with you being vaccinated for sure. Right. And also, for the most part, young kids, unless they had, again, certain health condition, if they got COVID, and you've heard this again and again and again, I, you know, my nephew, he was eight at the time. He got COVID and he was sick for a day and it was fine after that. But everybody, his mother, his father, his grandmother, his auntie, everybody else was sick for three weeks. And so they'd all been vaccinated. So it, it, there, this is, you know, you're going to find cases that don't make most kids have done well. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, the, the type 1 diabetic might have a problem. The asthmatic child might have a problem. Anyone with any of the blood disorders like leukemia and, and things like that, they're going more likely to have a problem. Anyone with any immune deficiency. You know, the number of people with HIV, percentage-wise, there are more people maybe getting COVID. <laughs> and their symptoms might last a little longer, but they recover. And again, it goes back, this really still goes back, what is the general basic wellness of the individual? What do you think the world is going to be like going forward? Or how should we think about COVID in the next year, two years? Well, I, I, I'll say this from what the, the CDC's recommendations and all of the infectious disease docs are saying uh, globally, as well as the World Health Organization, is that if, if people have not been vaccinated for more than six months, they probably should go and get a booster because there, there are two new variants out now. One is E E five something, and the other one is XXB one point something. They have caused mild symptoms, and it was in an accelerated phase during the winter months, December, January, February, but less so now. And so there's an expectation that there'll be a new variant soon, and so you want to get a booster shot in, in order to do that. And again, it goes back to common sense, you know, hand hygiene, washing your hand, covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze or staying hydrated, being as fit as you can be, eating healthy. All of these things, this is for any infection, but it's critical for a cold. Uh, Dr. K, you would uh, recommend the booster shot that's out there now? Even yeah. Fully yeah, you would recommend it. Well, Steve, what fully vaccinated to me only means that you've probably been more than six months and most people have gotten a booster. Yeah. So therefore, we, they expect that the, the strength and the protection of the vaccine starts to wane after six months. Okay. So booster, definitely. Okay. You're right. And I would say those of us who've been with kind of, it is in their best interest to get a booster. Yeah. Oh, okay. You already you already know what how bad it could be for you and how bad it was. For me clinically, having seen my patients in the hospital and, and I would say the data shown what it looked like for a patient to be on a respirator in the hospital with COVID, unlike anything I'd ever seen. Like mm. and we might not have had the resistance that we had if we just showed that. Okay. So this has been a, a great discussion because it captures on all aspects and a lot of the anecdotes that I'm sure a lot of our listeners have encountered. That Dr. K, I guess, just to sum up, what would be your two or three or even four, how many of you think you like, uh, takeaways for the future for us living with COVID? What's the best practices? You say? Well, I would say... COVID is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. So part of it is what can we do as individuals and a society and a world to mitigate it to the best of our ability. One is getting vaccines, appropriately so, doing 
appropriate things. Don't put yourself at risk. In other words, if you don't feel well, stay home. Stay safe. So we should not want to infect others because, again, very contagious. And we know that not everybody who's going to be exposed is going to get it. But they may be the person to pass it on to somebody who can't fight it well. You're not vaccinated. It makes it easier for that to happen. And the other important point is most of the hospitalization today and most of the cases of the more significant COVID infections are still in people over 60 or those with con- concomitant health issues. Yeah. Asthma, like diabetes, like heart disease, things like that. More immune deficiencies, those people, cancers, those people are more at risk. Not to say that the perfectly healthy person can't get it, because they do. Yeah. No question about it. And then, you, of course, your um, mention of hand hygiene and general hygiene and uh, exercise, fitness, of course. Exercise, water, more water, water, water. Okay. All right. I'll remember that when I'm on my fifth beer tonight. There's water and beer. Yeah, there is. There is. There Just is. Don't do the 12 and water only. <laughs> All right. Well, mm-hmm. on that note, thanks, guys. It was great. Thanks very much to uh, my co host, Dr. Richard Kennedy, Kettle and Kettle Hiding, and David List. Uh, it was a very informative discussion, and I think it covered a lot of topics that uh, uh, we often encounter with COVID and general health issues. Um, thank you for joining us, Wellness Musketeers. Tune in for upcoming episodes to gain the tools to improve your health, work performance, and live with a greater understanding of the world we experience together. Please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and share this recording with your family and friends. You can make a contribution through a link provided in program notes to allow this podcast to grow. Let us know what you need to learn to help you live your best life. Send your questions and ideas for future episodes to Dave Liss at David in list gmail.com. Thank you very much, folks, and have a wonderful day.